Introduction. The pursuit of being. Modern thought has realized considerable progress by reducing the existent to the series of appearances which manifest it. Its aim, meaning modern thought's aim, was to overcome a certain number of dualisms which have embarrassed philosophy and to replace them by the monism of the phenomenon. Has the attempt been successful? In the first place, we certainly thus get rid of that dualism which in the existent opposes interior to exterior. There is no longer an exterior for the existent, if one means by that a superficial covering which hides from sight the true nature of the object, uh, as in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. That's kind of what he's referring to there. And this true nature in turn, if it is to be the secret reality of the thing which one can have a presentiment of, or which one can suppose but never reach because it is the interior of the object under consideration, this nature no longer exists. The appearances which manifest the existent are neither interior nor exterior. They are all equal. They all refer to other appearances and none of them is privileged. Force, for example, is not a metaphysical conatus of an unknown kind which hides behind the effects, accelerations, deviations, etc. It is the totality of these effects. Similarly, an electric current does not have a secret reverse side. It is nothing but the totality of the physical chemical actions which manifest it. Electrolysis, the incandescence of a carbon filament, the displacement of the needle of a galvanometer, etc. No one of these actions alone is sufficient to reveal it, but no action indicates anything which is behind itself. It indicates only itself and the total series. The obvious conclusion is that the dualism of being and appearance is no longer entitled to any legal status within philosophy. The appearance refers to the total series of appearances and not to a hidden reality which would drain to itself all the being of the existent. And the appearance, for its part, is not an inconsistent manifestation of this being. To the extent that men had believed in noumenal realities, you know, like Kant's thing in itself, they have presented appearance as a pure negative. It was that which is not being. It had no other being than that of illusion and error. But even this being was borrowed. It was itself a pretense. And philosophers met with the greatest difficulty in maintaining cohesion and existence in the appearance so that it should not itself be reabsorbed in the depth of non-phenomenal being. But if we once get away from what Nietzsche called the illusion of worlds behind the scene, and if we no longer believe in the being behind the appearance, then the appearance becomes full positivity. Its essence is an appearing which is no longer opposed to being, but on the contrary is the measure of it. For the being of an existent is exactly what it appears. Thus, 
we arrive at the idea of the phenomenon such as we can find. For example, in the phenomenology of Husserl or of Heidegger, the phenomenon or the relative absolute. Relative the phenomenon remains, for to appear supposes in essence somebody to whom to appear, but it does not have the double relativity of Kant's Erscheinung. It does not point over its shoulder to a true being, which would be for it absolute. What it is, it is absolutely, for it reveals itself as it is. The phenomenon can be studied and described as such for it is absolutely indicative of itself. The duality of potency and act falls by the same stroke. The act is everything. Behind the act, there is neither potency nor hexis, nor virtue. We shall refuse, for example, to understand by genius in the sense in which we say that Proust was, had genius or that he was a genius, a particular capacity to produce certain works which was not exhausted exactly in producing them. <laughs> the genius of Proust is neither the work considered in isolation nor the subjective ability to produce it, it is the work considered as the totality of the manifestations of the person. That is why we can equally well reject the dualism of appearance and essence. The appearance does not hide the essence. It reveals it. It is the essence. The essence of an existent is no longer a property sunk in the cavity of this existent. It is the manifest law which presides over the succession of its appearances. It is the principle of the series. To the nominalism of Poincaré, defining a physical reality, an electric current, for example, <clears throat> as the sum of of its various manifestations, Duhem rightly opposed his own theory, which makes of the concept the synthetic unity of these manifestations. To be sure, phenomenology is anything but a nominalism, but essence, as the principle of the series, is definitely only the concatenation of appearances that is itself an appearance. This explains <clears throat> how it is possible to have an intuition of essences. The phenomenal being manifests itself. It manifests its essence as well as its existence, and it is nothing but the well-connected series of its manifestations. Does this mean that by reducing the existent to its manifestations, we have succeeded in overcoming all dualisms? It seems rather that we have converted them all into a new dualism, that of finite and infinite. Okay, so I'll repeat, have we succeeded in overcoming all dualisms? It seems rather that we have converted them all into a new dualism, that of the finite and the infinite. Yet the existent, in fact, cannot be reduced to a finite series of manifestations, since each one of them is a relation to a subject constantly changing. Although an object may disclose itself only through a single abschattung uh, profile, the sole fact of there being a subject 
implies the possibility of multiplying the points of view on that abshatung. This suffices to multiply to infinity the abshatung. <laughs> Furthermore, if the series of appearances were finite, that would mean that the first appearances do not have the possibility of reappearing, which is absurd, or that they can be all given at once, which is still more absurd. Let us understand indeed that our theory of the phenomenon has replaced the reality of the thing by the objectivity of the phenomenon and that it has based this on an appeal to infinity. The reality of that cup is that it is there and that it is not me. We shall interpret this by saying that the series of its appearances is bound by a principle which does not depend on my whim, but the appearance reduced to itself and without reference to the series of which it is a part, could be only an intuitive and subjective plentitude, the manner in which the subject is affected. If the phenomenon is to reveal itself as transcendent, it is necessary that the subject himself transcend the appearance toward the total series of which it is a member. He must seize red through his impression of red. By red is meant the principle of the series, the, electro the electric current through the electrolysis, etc. But if the transcendence of the object is based on the necessity of causing the appearance to be always transcended, the result is that on principle, an object posits the series of its appearances as infinite. Thus, the appearance, which is finite, indicates itself in its finitude, but at the same time, in order to be grasped as an appearance of that which appears, it requires that it be surpassed toward infinity. This new opposition, the finite and the infinite, or better, the infinite in the finite, replaces the dualism of being and appearance. What appears, in fact, is only an aspect of the object, and the object is altogether in that aspect and altogether outside of it. It is altogether within in that it manifests itself in that aspect. It shows itself as the structure of the appearance, which is at the same time the principle of the series. It is altogether outside, for the series itself will never appear, nor can it appear. Thus, the outside is opposed in a new way to the inside, and the being which does not appear to the appearance. Similarly, a certain potency returns to inhabit the phenomenon and confer on it its very transcendence, a potency to be developed in a series of real or possible appearances. The genius of Proust, even when reduced to the works produced, is no less equivalent to the infinity of possible points of view which one can take on that work and which we will call the inexhaustibility of Proust's work. But is not this inexhaustibility which implies a, trans a transcendence and a reference to the infinite, is not this an hexis at the exact moment when one apprehends it on the object? 
By hexis, he just means your take on things. The essence finally is radically severed from the individual appearance which manifests itself, since on principle, it is that which must be able to be manifested by an infinite series of individual manifestations. In this replacing a variety of oppositions by a single dualism on which they are all based, have we gained or lost? This we shall soon see. For the moment, the first consequence <clears throat> of the theory of the phenomenon is that the appearance does not refer to being as Kant's phenomenon refers to the noumenon, since there is nothing behind the appearance. <clears throat> and since it indicates <clears throat> only itself and the total series of appearances, it cannot be supported by any being other than its own. The appearance cannot be the thin film of nothingness which separates the being of the subject from the absolute being. If the essence of the appearance is an appearing which is no longer opposed to any being, there arises a legitimate problem concerning the being of this appearing. It is this problem which will be our first concern and which will be the point of departure for our inquiry into being and nothingness. Two, the phenomenon of being and the being of the phenomenon. The appearance is not supported by any existent different from itself. It has its own being. The first being which we meet in our ontological inquiry is the being of the appearance. Is it itself an appearance? It seems so at first. The phenomenon is what manifests itself and being manifests itself to all in some way, since we can speak of it, and since we have a certain comprehension of it. Thus, there must be for it a phenomenon of being, an appearance of being, capable of description as such. Being will be disclosed to us by some kind of immediate access, boredom, nausea, etc., and ontology, will be the description of the phenomenon of being as it manifests itself, that is, without intermediary. However, for any ontology, we should raise a preliminary question. Is the phenomenon of being thus achieved identical with the being of phenomena? In other words, is the being which discloses itself to me, which appears to me, of the same nature as the being of existence which appear to me? It seems that there is no difficulty. Husserl has shown how an eidetic reduction is always possible. That is, how one can always pass beyond the concrete phenomenon towards its essence. For Heidegger also, human reality is ontic ontological. That is, it can always pass beyond the phenomenon toward its being. But the passage from the particular object to the essence is a passage from homogenous to homogenous. Is it the same for the passage from the existent to the phenomenon of being? Is passing beyond the existent toward the phenomenon of being actually to pass beyond it toward its being as one passes beyond a particular red towards its essence? Let us consider further. In a particular object, one can always distinguish qualities like color, odor, etc. And proceeding from these, one can always determine an essence which they imply, as a sign implies its meaning. 
the totality object essence makes an organized whole, the essence is not in the object. It is the meaning of the object, the principle of the series of appearances which disclose it. But being is neither one of the object's qualities capable of being apprehended among others, nor a meaning of the object. The object does not refer to being as to a signification. It would be impossible, for example, to, defi to define being as a presence, since absence, too, discloses being, since not to be there means still to be. The object does not possess being, and its existence is not a participation in being, nor any kind of relation. It is. That is the only way to define its manner of being. The object does not hide being, but neither does it reveal being. The object does not hide it, for it would be futile to try to push aside certain qualities of the existent in order to find the being behind them. <laughs> being is being of them all equally. The object does not reveal being, for it would be futile to address oneself to the object in order to apprehend its being. The existent is a phenomenon. This means that it designates itself as an organized totality of qualities. It designates itself <clears throat> and not its being. Being is simply a condition of all revelation. It is being for revealing and not revealed being. <laughs> What then is the meaning of the surpassing toward the ontological of which Heidegger speaks? Certainly I can pass beyond this table or this chair towards its being and raise the question of the being of the table or the being of the chair. But at that moment, I turn my eyes away from the phenomenon of the table in order to concentrate on the phenomenon of being, which is no longer the condition of all revelation, but which itself is now something revealed, an appearance which, as such, needs in turn a being on the basis of which it can reveal itself. If the being of phenomena is not resolved in a phenomenon of being, and if nevertheless we cannot say anything about being without considering this phenomenon of being, then the exact relation which unites the phenomenon of being to the being of the phenomenon must be established first of all. We can do this more easily <clears throat> if we will consider <clears throat> that the whole of the preceding remarks has been directly inspired by revealing by the revealing intuition of the phenomenon of being. By not considering being as the condition of revelation, but rather being as an appearance which can be determined in concepts, we have understood, first of all, that knowledge cannot by itself give an account of being. That is, the being of the phenomenon cannot be reduced to the phenomenon of being. In a word, the phenomenon, of, the phenomenon of being is ontological in the sense that we speak of the ontological proof of Saint Anselm and Descartes. It is an appeal to being. It requires as phenomenon a foundation which is transphenomenal. The phenomenon of being requires the transphenomenality of being. That does not mean that being is found hidden behind phenomena. We have seen that the phenomena cannot hide being, nor that the phenomenon is an appearance which refers to a distinct being. The phenomenon exists only qua appearance. That is, it indicates itself on the foundation of being. What is implied by the preceding considerations is that the being of the phenomenon, although coextensive with the phenomenon, 
cannot be subject to the phenomenal condition, which is to exist only in so far as it reveals itself, and that consequently it surpasses the knowledge which we have of it and provides the basis for such knowledge.